Have you been enjoying our Impact Podcast and our great guests? Then please give us a thumbs up and leave a five-star review on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your favorite podcasts. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigarin, and I'm so honored to have with us today Xavier Roussel. He's the Chief Marketing and Sustainability Officer for the Dole Food Company. Welcome, Xavier, to the Impact Podcast. Thanks for having me. Happy to have you today. Technology connects us wonderfully. I'm sitting in beautiful Fresno, California today, and you're sitting in wonderful Charlotte, North Carolina. And, uh, and we get to talk about your great and iconic brand, Dole, today. But, Xavier, before we do that, I'd love you to share with our listeners and viewers a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and how you got on this wonderful and important journey, not only at Dole, but even before that, and, and, uh, and how you ended up here in this important position that you are today as the Chief Marketing and Sustainability Officer at Dole. Oh, absolutely! That is quite uh, quite a journey. But um, I, I grew up in the uh, in the center of France, in a small town, uh, about two hundred miles south of uh, Paris. Okay, beautiful region, beautiful oh. ancient castles. Oh, wine and cheese, like everywhere else in France. But but right. you know, like a, a very very nice uh, part of France. Um, I went to college. I have a business degree, and. After that, I basically entered in the produce industry by by accident, really. I already had signed for a contract in a bank. And, mm. and I got offered a job as a banana salesperson. And that was totally new to me. I, I didn't expect that. I didn't prepare for that much. But I really love that idea of, of the global trade. Um, and these, you know, the, the, this was an industry that all of a sudden this proposal made me think and then um, I basically accepted it. I, I declined on the bank and I never turned back. That's been 30 years I've been in the produce industry. It's a great industry. Wow. Um, essentially, I think what got me there were my language skills. Um, at the time, we're talking here the, the 90s, right? Yeah. Europe became a single market. So you had a lot of French people talking to each other, a lot of German people talking to each other, but they weren't very good at trading with each other. And I think those skills, the language skills got me the, you know, the job. They were looking for a new generation of people who were doing this. So um, a lot of trade and, I mean, going to Latin America, buying. I, I started in bananas, right, like purchasing products, coming back. And then the whole, like, Eastern Europe opening as well. That, that was also a very important moment in the, in the early 90s. Um, uh, Poland, right, all these countries were opening up. So it's been a, an important trade moment, which I, I, I participated in, and, and um, that really, you know, got me in the produce industry. Growing up in France, my experience and my travels on business, mostly business, some pleasure, is that Europe as a whole, but France even specifically, was had already sustainability and circular economy behavior generationally baked into your community and your culture dating back maybe 40 or 50 years, much further back and much uh, forward thinking than North America has been. Is that, is, was that part of your upbringing 
given that you're uh, um, a, a denizen of of France, did would you grow up in a community uh, 200 miles or so outside of of Paris? Was it much more sustainable, sustainably oriented? Because when I grew up in New York City, sustainability, circular economy, and thinking about the environment really wasn't, unfortunately, back then, part of the DNA of America or New York City. Was it different in France? You know what? Yes, I, I did. I, I mean, I have some connection to the farming uh, world, if you will, the farming communities. My, my, my own dad has a farm. So we, we right, my families, there are a lot of family conversation about this. So it's sort of, you know, it was around me. I, I would be totally unable to manage a farm. Let's be very clear about this. I, I never I never was a, a, a farmer. But sustainable, I mean, the, recycling, the just even things like recycling and taking care of the environment, wasn't that more of a uh, of an of, a, of an issue that was important to Europe and even France more specifically than it was in America much earlier? I would say probably yes. Okay, uh, there was always this stewardship from 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 the land, but it's it's hard to say. Like I I, I wasn't in the same years in the U.S. and met the farmer. Yeah. Because I, I still. You know, today the, the the people I meet here in farming communities do seem to have a very sort of very like minded. Oh so yeah, I'd say you know Things France had that sort of thing, but I wouldn't want to hype it either. I mean, I, yeah. I think any farmer has that kind of conscious, regardless of where they are. And I've seen farmers yeah. pretty much around the world. So I, I would say you 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 find that same care for you know their assets, but also their community. Right. In sense. Yeah, interesting. Um, talk about when did you specifically join Dull, and what did you first do at Dull, and how did that how did that evolve? How did your uh, duties and 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 title evolve at Dull? Well, it changed quite a bit. Um, I entered. Um, I worked in the citrus industry for a little bit. I lived in Spain for for oh. for, for some time. Then I moved to South Africa to for 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 grapes and other type of of, of fruit. Uh, we opened up an office there, so you know in, that's now the the late nineties. Wow. Um, and then I came back into the the banana trade, and I, I I got a number of of positions, most of them like in in product management. Um, it has to do with sort of like from from the farm, how do you sort of split a crop? Of bigger and smaller fruit, early and late, right? Where do you ship them to to basically maximize income from a farming side? What packaging do you use, right? And and then ultimately, what kind of campaigns do you to activate? But th th this is the way you look at marketing produce. is is a lot of supply chain, um, and and that's what I've done in the early years. That that was um, at Dole basically until two thousand eight. Um, in different positions in different countries, um, and I always had the sort of the the new job. I, I I got lucky because I always the job that nobody had done, like the new assignments. Right. And I'm very thankful for this because these are very formative years where yeah, I encourage everybody to you know pick up jobs that you know nobody knows how to do because right. you know you it, it's really sort of um, you know it's, it's you can make it what you want then you can make yeah. it what you want and what they need. Absolutely. Yeah. And then in 2008, I moved into marketing properly, sort of a marketing okay. job. Um, but there as well, I came back to those, you know, those, those, those farming. Much of what I concentrated on was trying to give the value behind the product, right? So when th there's so many things we do and the public doesn't know and we wish they did. Um, so, you know, products like bananas, right? They are ubiquitous. They're fairly you know, inexpensive, right? For for sixty cents, you have a pound of bananas, right? That very few items in in any store would would go at that value, and yet there is so much care behind it, right? There is so much manual work and and, and attention. So many of my campaigns, and the, I think the, the most successful one, the most fun to do too, was called "Visit My Farm." It rolled several years in a row, and. You know, the best experience we could give anyone is to fly them out and show them a farm, but we can't do that, right? Like we do this to our buyers, but you can't do this to people on the street. So we we um, we basically gave them a digital experience of it as a proxy. 
Oh. So we, we label the, the farm codes onto the stickers. People could see that food come from. And the back of this, we would sort of either in VR or in all sorts of Google Street View type of videos would show them, like give them a sense of how much effort there is behind a product that may look fairly sort of commoditized. So I ended up spending quite a bit of time in farms and, and talking to people who were in charge of sustainability. So that, that was, you know, uh, between 2008 and 2014. And in 2014, actually, sustainability got added to my title. So almost, almost 10 years ago. Wow. And then ever since, I've been sort of running the twin parallel, both marketing and sustainability. So, you know, that's uh, marketing I get and is a, a legacy position throughout most corporations and organizations around the world. Sustainability, since we've been doing this show now, Xavier, of almost uh, 16 and a half years, 2,100 guests or so, what we've learned along the way is sustainability or impact or diversity and inclusivity can mean, NESG can mean so many things at so many different companies. What does it specifically mean in terms of your philosophy and goals at Dole? And for our listeners and viewers, to find Xavier and his colleagues and all the important work they're doing in sustainability, please go to www.dole.com. I'm sorry, I'll go back to my question. What does sustainability mean in terms of your goals and philosophies at Dole? Uh -huh. So what, what, when we think of, of, of this, we, we really have a framework that goes around three pillars. What's material to us, where we have an impact, right? Where right. we focus on. The first pillar is definitely central is people. We have uh, 40,000 employees, and from these 40,000, about 30 or you know thousand would be blue collar workers somewhere in a farm in Latin America or Central America, right? So we have this large workforce, and then around these, we have of course all the growers that are associated to us, and we know them by first and last name, right? This is not like we're not buying commodities in the stock exchange or anything. These are farmers we know we that farms right. next to us. Sure. Uh, so th this is the type of, you know, we have long term relationship with them, sometimes decades, um, wow. and then we have the communities around them. So all of these different right. Uh, pieces makes the, the people side very relevant to us. Um, this is a labor intensive industry. Uh, so we write a lot of hands, doesn't mechanize easily. Mm. Some, and it does progress, but there's still a lot of like manual labor. Then we have a second pillar that is very intuitive about nature. So we, as a business, we own over um, 100,000 acres of land on which we have five or 6,000 of uh, conservation areas, forests, right? These sort of things. Um, a lot of ecosystems to protect, right? So we are the steward of that land and we need to give it back better than we found it, right? I think that's, that's how right. people describe it, but we take that same mission at heart and, and these are important, you know, an important mission yeah. in, in our case. So, I mean, we, we will go into detail, more into details of this, but, you know, Nature overall covers water, covers biodiversity, covers soil. We, we, we can talk about it. You and know, then yeah, go ahead. there is a food pillar, the third mm. pillar. Mm. And it's very specific to our produce industry. We feel we have a greater responsibility to promote healthy eating. Mm. Um, we supply you know, incredible products. Um, and therefore, we, we have... You know, like promoting healthy nutrition in different ways, right? To different audiences, to different people. Um, I mean, some people can afford them, but it, they don't quite. But we we believe at the heart, our products offer people longer and healthier lives. And and you know, it's almost like 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 uh, public health type of messaging, right? Right. So we do a lot of this, and then we also we'll talk about like we you know, food insecurity is something that we do. We do um, have it hard to, we can speak about separately, but that's the food pillar, the third. Um, and again, a special responsibility because of the product we sell. That's right. Um, talking about produce, you know, I've, I'm, I'm in my 60s now and I grew up and to me, dole means bananas, which I love your dole bananas and I love your pineapples. Talk a little bit about 
what you've seen has changed. You know, you've been doing the produce industry and you've been a leader in the produce industry now for over 25 years, Xavier. What, what, you know, what, how did, how has the produce industry changed in terms of how we get our produce now, as opposed to when you got in the industry? So many, many ch ch things that have changed. So maybe we can split this one in two pieces. I mean, okay. That, Consumers see and the piece that they may not see, like the one that's really yeah, that's important. Scene, right? That's important, yeah. But let, just to remind people, because sometimes we, you know, year go by and we don't quite realize. But first of all, local farming has been heavily promoted, and that mm. is credit to retail. Uh, and I think that's great. I think connecting people with their own communities, with their own farming, I encourage everyone to go and visit a farm. I mean, it's a life changing experience. I think, in my view, anyone we brought to our farms. I had that kind of experience. So encourage I and mean, everyone go visit a local farms and ideally, ideally you produce one, of course. So that the promotion of these products is very seasonal, but it's very important. But then we have the sort of flip side of this is what has changed truly is that we have categories that run the 12 months. Mm. So how does this go? Mm. If you want to improve the consumption of anything mm. in food, you need to have them at a, a, um, a high level of quality and always available. Consumers want to choose, right? As much as they would sort of have very seasonal things. If you, you know, healthy nutrition is built around habits, good habits. Right. And to build those habits, you need to have food around you every day or every week, depending. You change, you rotate, there's so many, right? But that kind of availability, think of berries. 20 years ago, oh, yeah. they were very seasonal, they were very uneven in quality. You never knew whether you're going to pick a good one. Today in retail, you find a superb type of berries, like things, uh, I mean, strawberries have been around, of course, a long, long time. But right. think raspberries, think blueberries. They've become year round. And that's when, from a consumption perspective, we truly see the number coming up. Oh. It's not just a one off, right? It's just not a, but it's part of your diet. This right. is the, the the food you're defaulting to, and that's right. your comfort food. That's all. That's right. All of this, and and this is where you start building consumption and, and healthy eating. Right. That, I think this is what we see. Then you could talk about the varieties. Like think of you know think of the apple category. Right. How many varieties of apples there are today? You may even you know make your head spin. There's so many, but they're delicious. Right. They're they're superb. And what goes for Apple goes for many other things. So we are given a wider choice. For many years, we didn't see much innovation in the category, right? We, we recently brought a new pineapple. I mean, great success. It was, we, we thought, okay, that's one more pineapple. People know what a pineapple is. That's, this is a, a great product. This is really a higher sort of standard of, of the eating experience is, is, is awesome. How's it different? We were, Explain. Sorry. How is it different? Explain what your new pineapple is. Well, we we it's it's called golden selection. We let it longer on the on the, on, on the plant, right? We uh -huh. harvest it at, at peak maturity. You when you buy it, you need to eat it pretty quickly because it's uh -huh. it's really ripe. But it's it's superb. Oh, and it flew off the shelf. So we this is a category in which there is a lot of innovation now and more hunger for it. So I think this is what has changed. Oh. If you go back twenty years, I'd, I'd say. And and the last point, uh, you know, that comes to mind is convenience. Um, think of salads in bags, right? Bag salads. Um, how it's it's double digit growth for years and years, um, based on making the product convenient. You know, you have your 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 pouch, you have the dressing, the croutons, or whatever comes with it. This this really nice mix of salad, and they offer you wonderful flavors and. This has really sort of expanded the category dramatically. Pineapple, nowadays, about 50% of the category sold cut. It was a fraction of this um, um, sort of, you know, 20 years ago. It, it wasn't that much. Today, the, 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 the shift is towards, you know, buying pineapple chunks fresh in, in, in cups as opposed to the whole fruit. Um, you mentioned... What's forward facing are some of the great things you just mentioned. More availability of products, new categories of products. Um, but talk about 
some of the things we don't know and don't see, overtly see as consumers, what should we know about fresh produce that you know that's important for us to know? I mean, the main message here is we became so much better farmers. Uh, and, and this came many different ways. Um, I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the change in the categories, I could have said the rise of organics, for example, right? Double right. digits for years right. and years. Right. But as a consumer, you see organic as, as a product. We see it as, of course, it's a farming method. Mm. We started our organic business already 25 years ago this year. We were among the, the, the first one to, to explore it. And we learned a lot from it. I mean, from a philosophical standpoint, from, from a goal standpoint, we like soil management, Th that got us into a lot of new, you know, a new approach to farming. Mm. And we were both, right? So people rotate, we, we had our organic people going to conventional back and forth. And, and so we had a lot of, of um, uh, cross-pollination between the, you know, the organic business on the farming side and, and, and the conventional business. But I also say that the conventional business has improved incredibly. And that's probably the most overlooked topic here. Like people would steal in their heads, you know, they, they, they might not know how much. I mean, we can blame them for that. You'd have to visit a farm for it. And not many people get to do that. But how much more efficient this industry has remained? Um, we do, we keep a lot of research in-house. So we, we, we kept that knowledge that, it, you know, the investigation, selecting better varieties and and it's us, but it's across the industry, you know, other companies, the, the, the produce industry overall. Um, a lot of research being made, um, a lot of efficiency being gained, a lot of precision. And has resulted in that, I mean, for better water management, uh, lowering uh, a crop protection application. I mean, ultimately resulting in, in, in a lower carbon footprint, right? Like when you have a better soil management, um, it has, it has evolved for the better and, and, and at, at a steady pace and elevated pace. So I, I would think this is something that people do not see, but I think uh, it should be highlighted that the work that farmers have done collectively in the background is tremendous. Sitting in the seat that you sit, which is very unique, Chief Marketing and Sustainability Officer, now that you've been there 25 years, are you more excited about the future and about what you see as trends coming, such as um, Dan Butner and his wonderful uh, Blue Zones and the, and the uh, democratization of information about the Blue Zones, where people live the longest and the healthiest on the planet? And mostly that's that Mediterranean diet, which, of course, is fresh fruits and vegetables, grains and legumes, and a little bit of meat. Um, of course, there's other things that go into their healthy lifestyles as well as community and, and purpose. But the trends of, of Blue Zone, of getting away from processed foods to more natural foods, including plant-based eating. Um, and, and as you say, in the proliferation of these wonderful food chains that care about where their products are derived, such as Whole Foods, Irwan, and other, you know, Albertsons and all these other wonderful food outlets that care about sustainable and regenerative agriculture and, and organic, uh, organic fruit and vegetables. Are you more excited really in some now about the future and these wonderful trends that are going to push more people towards your great products that you're taking more care in, in, in creating anyway, or uh, is there something else going on? No, we, we're beyond excited by these trends because yeah. this is what we've been advocating for. And again, it's this something that is good for people, right? They, it's, it's something that this living a, a longer and, and healthier life right. should be on everybody's agenda, of course. And so it's, it's a bit of a no brainer, right? So, you know, making this change in your life that, I mean, again, it's, it's, at the, it's, it's public policy, right? It's, that's, yeah. that's, we as a private company are advocating for it, but yeah, it's, it's the common good, right? So we, we, this is very much where we, where we are a balanced lifestyle, right? We are not, you know, we take people where they are, right? Like we understand the consumers want choices. They want, they want, um, they have different approaches to this, but 
we see the direction very clear and and we're very excited to see that sort of tide coming at us and sort of uh, uh and the consumers you know onboarding that journey with us and many people remain on the fence right yeah. so there is a growing group of 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 people who embrace that lifestyle and there are still a number of people on the fence looking at it and thinking yeah well you know shall i and then it's the how right like what we're trying to do is how do you get there? Because the idea, I think everybody knows, right? Like it's, you don't need to convince anyone about the goodness of fruit and vegetable or the benefit of this lifestyle in general, right? Like you, you don't, people know. The question is, how do you do this? We were talking about how do we gain those habits? How do we get into them? How do we, right? How do we do this and it doesn't feel like we're constrained in it. Um, we're not pushed towards it. We, you know, this is something we, we, we like doing. So the how is very important. Therefore, we, we are leaning a lot of re on recipes and sort of the, how do you get there? Like people, helping people incrementally get towards that goal that they've set for themselves. So I'm now 61. I've been a vegetarian since I'm 17 and a, and a plant-based eater for about 13 years. One thing I've recognized, Xavier, is this. I have a three and a half year old granddaughter. And so as a chief marketing officer, you know, I see what her friends eat but I also see that since we keep so many fruits and vegetables in the house, that children basically look to their elders in the household for leadership on how to eat. They're 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 blank they're blank uh, canvases, and they'll mimic the their parents or their grandparents' eating habits. How do you now market to the next young generation to help improve? their eating habits or are you marketing to their parents and grandparents so they bring it into the household so those children grow up enjoying your delicious pineapples or bananas or uh blueberries or strawberries or all the other wonderful array of delicious products that you guys carefully um and sustainably grow and and then deliver to us to our local supermarkets so we have multiple initiatives there um yeah. and very different one from the other. Yeah. Uh, but we, in certain countries, we would go school to school. And wow. we, would be, we have teams of nutritionists and, and the school welcome us with open arms because oh, that's this is not part of the curriculum, right? In, 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 in many places, it is not. And I think there is a definite appetite, if you can say it so, from school, like uh, principals, teachers, right. parents for their kids to be exposed to that type of messaging. Then we do a lot of campaigning on our products. We've been in partnership with Disney quite some time. We've used, uh, uh, you know, uh, Marvel and, and right, Star That's Wars cool. and all these products. And people initially thought, oh, look at this, this is odd. You know, we're finding Star Wars. Well, you know, how about, you know, if it helps your kid eat broccoli and, and, and right? And I right. think the community is sort of self-regulated there and the people saw the benefit. So that's another avenue. Uh, to address these these younger group, and then of course we are on social, on social media, right? Uh, and 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 you know, uh, talking to all these generation in a different way, but um, we meet many of these young consumers on social media promoting fresh you know, products. You know, given that there's also been a very big push for low carb, high high protein eating, keto eating, whatever you want to call it. And, and, and this is not to knock any of those programs. If it works for you, I'm I'm happy for other people. But the people say, well, fruit has too much sugar. And I and I and I'm not a I don't adhere to that. I um I love fruit. So and I love you know all, all good produce and fruits and vegetables. How do you work around those those um sometimes faddish trends, sometimes longstanding trends how do you help those folks integrate fruit and vegetables into their diet to make them understand that yeah keto eating or low carb eating can be great for you in in some in some way form or shape if it helps you maintain your weight and your and your and your goals your your wellness goals but how do you help them also integrate your great products into their uh systems and also get over some of the more common myths that are out there yeah, we, we we have a list of these myths. That we we, yeah. we try to debunk them. You know, right, right. How do you debunk the myths? On, I mean, I mean. think on social media, I see it's such. I mean, you see, you know, these kind oh. of those pop up and say, "Don't eat these, don't eat that," you know. So, 
I think we're trying to debunk many of these and we're trying to, um, yeah, we, we have a nutritionist in-house because it's it's a core competence we, we yeah. want to have and and to spread the message and to write to 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 address the you know each and every one but also let's say again we don't come into the very detail of you know, the you know the little kind of the smaller pocket of this we we advocate for a like a, a holistic lifestyle where right. it's not highly functional although um let's say this is a test we've done it's more of a fun fact but if you are say um, if you exercise the weekends or or even more regularly, if you're sort of a bit of an athlete, uh, you might eat different bars and different you know sports drinks. We've actually in a performance lab compared athletes on sports drinks versus um, athlete on banana and water, and wow. guess what? The performance doesn't doesn't change. So yeah. you might as well rethink the the sort of the type of of food you take. Uh, uh, to exercise because even sort of on a, on a performance basis, uh, you, you know, banana and water would supply you with exactly all you need in terms of nutrients, um, uh, antioxidant, and etc. Like all the nutrition you need as an right. athlete as well, right? So it's food for every day. It's food to go to school. It's food to snack in the office. It's food, but it's also food to 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 exercise and and it's more in in a more functional type of environment. And it's so interesting you say that because you see some of the greatest athletes in the world, the highest performers in between their during their games or in between their sets or matches or whatever they're playing, whatever the type of the sport, always, always eating a banana in between. And I eat a banana in between my workouts and it's the easiest thing on the stomach. And it just gives me the cleanest energy. Honest to gosh, I've, I've always relied on bananas. I just love them. We We don't have quite the marketing budget to get them. To be our own ambassadors, but you know, they, they, in a certain way, they do. Sure, by their lifestyle, and I Correct. think that 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 counts too. That counts too. Um, do you, do you, in your position as chief sustainability officer, do you guys produce at Dole um, an impact or sustainability report every year that you publish? Yes, we have uh, a all this letters report is is online on on Dole.com. It can be found. Yeah, and it, and it lives in perpetuity on Dole.com. Yes. Got it. What keeps you up at night, Xavier? What, you know, obviously a leader like you, you know, there's so many things that we could find to worry about. You know, we're inundated with bad news all the time. The externalities that we don't have control over um, sometimes can make things feel a little bit out of control. You know, you're a seasoned professional. You've been doing, doing, you know, you've been with Dole 25 years. What keeps you up at night? And what are some of the um, counter- actions that you take to overcome uh, the, 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 the things that are issues that are worrying you the most? Plenty, right? It, I mean, first of all, I want the message out because I think we discussed the nutrition piece just now, sure. how nutritious is good for you. Sure. But people also need to know that that diet is also the lowest environmental impact there is. Mm. We are on both sides of that pyramid on the best part, meaning if you think of your of, of carbon footprint or water footprint, as a matter of fact, um, if you compare fruit and vegetable to other sorts of food, uh, our impact is is the lowest, um, way below, you know, multiple times below any type of food and eggs and poultry and grain and 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 and, and cheese and and I'm not even mentioning meat, uh, right? So. I think if you want to have not only like a nutritious and a good for you diet, but also a low impact diet, fruit and vegetable is the food to go to, right? So one more reason I think that people should be aware of and 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 you know relook at their food and veg under that kind of a light. But I think this is you know from a communication standpoint that keeps me up at night. I I, I would like uh, uh, people to know that. But then I mean, there are many challenges, right? In spite of having the lowest carbon footprint, it doesn't mean that we don't need to decarbonize because we still have a footprint. Right. Um, we have emissions in two areas. One is shipping. We own and operate 13 ships ourselves. Mm. Works like clock, right? They, they, they go from one place to the other, leave on a certain day, arrive on a certain day hour every week for decades, right? This is how efficient that business is. But you know, we look at the future of the of the shipping industry. We've already invested in our fleet to get more efficient vessel. But 
you know, the future is like, what are we going to do? Like, what kind of technology is going to establish itself? What kind of fuel going to be available to us, right? So in, in terms of decarbonization, the, the, the main topic is time, right? We are against tight deadlines. We, we need to act, right? Like as a, as, a, as, a, you know, as a company, as an industry, right? But the guidance is always clear and the solutions are always available. So I think this kind of uh, balancing act between the deadlines and the, and, the, uh, uh, and the assignment, right? I think that's, that's a very important topic. And the same applies to uh, emissions from fertilization, right? In farming, this is you know, an important source. Like, can we find alternative fertilizer, right? How can we best manage soil to be able to do that? We've made a great achievement in the past in our uh, 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 pineapple production, actually, we by incorporating residue of crop residue into the ground, we were talking re regenerative agriculture earlier. For seven, eight years in a row, we've actually uh, uh, taken those 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 residue, shredded them, put them into the soil, you know, use microorganisms to digest them faster, and eventually reduce uh, uh, carbon emission by by thirty percent. So that, that these are the issues, right? That We've done great things. There is more to go, right? The, the the road is still is still there. So decarbonization definitely. I think water availability at a certain horizon, right? Like what 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 do we do there? In, you know, we some areas we farm in are high stress area. Think Chile, think Spain, think Morocco, right? So whether whether we have our own farms or somebody else is farming, you know, regardless, right? Like I think we need to think. Of this proactively, but yeah, I, I was mentioning biodiversity or, or, and I mean land, but reversing that trend that is, is experienced in biodiversity is very high priority. We do have a special role there. Um, well, we can speak about what we do there, and then, generally speaking, social impact. Right, we have that large workforce. Right, we, you know, we we want. These these people to stay engaged to basically I don't know, how do we train them how do we make this community thrive, and 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 grow them in the long term. And it's true for us. It's true for labor. I mean, the labor force in agriculture has been a shrinking pool, and so we we need to think of this long term and 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 basically secure the long term future of our labor force. It's it's very important. Understood. You know, I know you're a publicly traded company, and there's only so much you could say. But if I was to ask you. In 2024 and beyond, Xavier, what are you most excited about? What initiatives get you to jump out of bed in the morning and 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 uh, get over to your office in Charlotte? What's the most exciting initiatives you have coming up that you're allowed to talk about? No, we 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 have a few that we definitely can talk about. I think I'm excited about the research we're carrying out. Okay, I think uh, you know we if we want to uh, uh, you know. Uh, face some, you know, we have disease that we need to face, like Sigatoka, we have to, like basically affecting the production. There is so much more research to come and we are ramping up mm -hmm. our effort. I mean, th these are important uh, topics that we work on, we we've published on it. Uh, so these are important challenges that we want to see progress in. So th th these are, you know, this is one, one aspect, for example, research in general. Um, I'll talk about circularity. We we've actually we have amazing project. Uh, we generate a lot of plastic waste on a farm, right? You have twines, you have bags, oh. you have uh, all sorts of pads, and then we built factories to recycle this, and we turn them into pellets, and then we turn them into corner boards, and then we send them to the market. So this is this was an incredible project because it turned out that this factory, the one we built in Costa Rica, for example, ended up recycling the plastic from the community. So we, we have people collecting plastic in the community, creating jobs, and then this plastic doesn't end up in the environment, goes into the plant and is turned into that. The way we would like to take this is to increase circularity, right? Like be, have a more, make sure the plastic or part of it or a growing part of it actually returns to the farm. So what kind of plastic could we reuse, right? Uh, we can't exactly do redo bags or twines. We'd have to find an alternative product. But these are sort of things that we are excited about. But still, that would be closed loop recycling. The fact that you're doing open loop circular economy recycling in that they're going back into new products, even though they're not going back to directly to your farms, still disavows us of this boogeyman of plastic 
when you watch the media, the mainstream media, all plastic is boogeyman. All plastic is bad and polluting the ocean. And you're just disavowing that, saying, no, 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 John, we're taking a good chunk of the plastic that we're creating. We have our own recycling facilities and putting it into new products. And that itself is wonderful news. That yeah, itself- I mean, we, it, it, it's quite an achievement. Yeah. Uh, if you've traveled in many of these countries, plastic is poorly recycled. So again, we we, we really, you know, this is... That's wonderful. Yeah, like a groundbreaking work that that uh, is Good even for you. most of it, say, from a cultural standpoint. These are our sustainability effort is is truly grassroots based. Meaning, this is not anyone from from an office like one that I sit in that comes and sit, tells people. Many of these initiatives are local, and they're very embedded into the structure. This, this plant was built 20 years ago and thrived since then. And it has it up and down, but now it's thriving. Many of the initiatives that we've done through the company are that way, meaning it's someone who locally felt empowered enough, curious enough, involved enough to make a difference. And to me, what you were, you know, sort of who inspiring me, these are these people who inspire me. These things were not necessarily part of the job description when it's the, when they started, right? And uh, there are quite a few in our company that have done exactly that, that have sort of said, well, I'm interested in this. Like, could I maybe study this? And and this has given amazing results. Like we have one guy who created a, like a, a, you know, social foundation resulting in, in, in like, we, we nowadays we operate about 20 doctors in rural Ecuador and Peru. We put doctors in, in 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 containers, right? Like we turn containers into medical sort of offices, and we have them tour the communities that are a little remote, and we there are people get their medical attention that way. We, I mean, this is not heavy medicine. This is the daily medicine, but this yes. is the one for yes. me. So th- these kind of initiatives were created by by people I know, and people I I I, I so uh, much respect for, basically having you know the invested their time, went out of their way. And, and you know, sometimes these project, take, these project take a long time, but when they flourish, it's, it's, it's so good to see. This one is, is, is one, you know, the recycling is, is, it's one project, but there are many others. So it's really your stakeholders that get to inspire you and inform you as to what initiatives and to tackle and how to go tackle them. Yes, because we need to tackle the needs where they are, especially for us, like we operate yes. in so many geographies. There is not a one size fit all. There right, is no, there right. is no so, you know, I was in rural Peru and what the town wanted is a park. Is a park to meet in the evening. And that foundation is basically that we 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 convince our growers to put a few cents of their banana price and our own and 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 create those projects in 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 that in those communities. And we built them a park and the community was so, I mean, this is what they needed. This is what they wanted. You go there by by the sunset, you see all these people congregating and the kids playing. And that's sort of very, you know, impactful project at eye level, right? Like this is what the people wanted. That's what they got. And so we feel extremely satisfied by this kind of, 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 of realization. I love that because like you said, sitting in our offices where we sit, there's a a little there's somewhat of a disconnect between all of our stakeholders around the planet. There's no way for us to know. So it's better for them to come to bring that to you from the ground up, so you fulfill the real needs and not just hypothetically come up with what 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 should be done. You're really filling the needs that are the most pressing and important needs that they care about the most. It's wonderful. It makes most let, sense. Let me give you another example. Yeah, of these because I think they, they truly inspire me. Yeah. Um, Workers have said that they were struggling with red tape, like administrative tasks, and, sure. and 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 you know, in some of the Latin countries, it's complicated. Opening a bank account is complicated. Uh, filing for document, like like getting benefits, is complicated. So we created it's it's just an office, a person on a phone, but who has these connections, who knows how to fill the forms, and it was a worker's request. And we call it information center, right? It's again a glorified desk and telephone, but with a qualified person, and that person resolves problem for them. Um, they might have an undocumented spouse, right? Or they might have 
whatever the, 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 the issue may be, we're trying to, to make it, like it makes a difference in their lives. And I think that's what matters. Uh, so the very high level, very grassroots, but you know, common sense kind of thing. So we, we, we you know, this is something I, that inspire me from, you know, what our teams, uh, uh, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the simplest of idea. You're giving them an advocate that knows how to find the answers to the problems that they most, they most commonly face. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah. I love it. Well, Xavier, I love having you on. I want to have you on. I want to have you back on to continue this journey. As you and I both know, there's no finish line in sustainability. It's truly a journey. Uh, it's just fascinating and wonderful to have such an iconic and important brand like Dole and you on, on the Impact podcast, because we've never had a brand such as yours on, on the Impact before after all these years. So this is such an important episode to share this kind of information with our audience out there. I thank you again for your time today. For our listeners and viewers who want to find Xavier and his colleagues and the important and sustainable work they're doing at Dole, please go to www.dole.com. Xavier, thank you for your time today. Thank you for your wisdom and your thoughts. But most important, thank to you and your colleagues at Dole for making the world a better place. I'll share the message. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com.